Hey yeah, so I noticed that there isn't really a short, simple video on Xnode implementation in Unity, which is kind of a shame. Xnode is a really useful framework for building node-based solutions to everyday game development problems, and I use it often for in-game cinematography and dialogue systems and the like. I find it very helpful because the graph system it uses scales up well. You don't need one single massive tree full of your dialogue, for instance. You can split it up between multiple separate files so it's less of a hassle to get what you need to find quickly, and once you've built the parsing system it's pretty much endlessly extensible. So yeah, today I'm going to do that for a bit. Because it's my primary use case for this library, today I'm going to show you how to make a dialogue system. But the methods I use can be extended to more or less any application where a visual scripting or node-based solution would be helpful. This does require a bit of C-sharp knowledge, but don't worry if you don't have any because I'll do all of the heavy lifting. I'm just going to drop a metal bar for no reason. So we're here in Unity and the first step is to install the Xnode library. This is very straightforward, you can download it from GitHub from the link in the description. Once you've downloaded the .zip file, drag the Xnode folder of whatever version you're using into Unity project and it'll automatically run all of the magic nonsense required to update your editor with the new functionality. I've built a little UI for our dialogue, but you'll notice that it's currently missing, you know, dialogue. Let's see if we can fix that. I like to separate my node scripts and my other C-sharp scripts from each other because it makes it easier to find what I'm looking for, but organize your code base however you want. Either way, find somewhere to put all of your node junk and create a new xnode graph script there. Name it something like dialogue graph. Hang on to it because we're going to open it later. Next, create a new xnode node script and call it something like base node or core node or something like that. This is the template that we're going to extend nodes from later. Double click it to open it up in Visual Studio or Mono Develop or, I don't know, Microsoft PowerPoint or whatever. Once you've opened it up, up, the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that this script extends from node by default rather than mono behavior. This is cool because it lets us utilize all of the xnode functions required for the system to work. Next, we're going to create all of the data functions we need to access data from nodes later. Considering we're making a dialogue system, some of the data we might need access to are strings, naturally because there's a lot of words involved. We might also want a sprite for the person who's currently talking. Create a new function in your script. If you haven't created a function before, then keep watching. If you have, you can skip to this time code to get to the bit you care about. If you're still here, the general structure of a function is fairly straightforward. You start by setting its protection level. This can be public or private, and generally the difference is that public functions can be accessed from other scripts, while private functions can only be used within the script that contains them. For this, we want these functions to be public because we're going to be calling it from a different script later. Next is the keyword virtual. Adding this keyword to a function lets us override it later in scripts that inherit from this one. That's going to be important for reasons I'll get into when we get there, so I'll explain how that works in a second. Then, we specify what we want the function to return. A return is pretty much just the data that gets spit out at the end of a function's life cycle. If you don't want the function to return anything, you would put void here, and the function would just do whatever it does. But because we want this function to give us a string when it's finished, we can put string here to set it up. Finally, we name it. We should name it something memorable so that we know what to call later if we need to. I'll name this one get string. Notice the round brackets. If we want to pass other data to this function for it to act on, we would put it there but we don't need to for this. So anyway, if you're just joining us after skipping to this time code, we've made a function called public virtual string get string. This lets us override this function in scripts that inherit from this one. That's going to be important for when we implement our graph parsing system in a hot second. You'll also notice that this is throwing an error right now because I haven't told this function to return anything. This function won't actually be called in this script, so we can just put return null here. A quick aside, not all data types allow you to return null as a result, and you may need to input some dummy data here. It won't matter because we're not gonna call it. Right, good, step one is finished. We're a thousand words in the script and only halfway into page two. It's going to be a long afternoon. Before we make any of our specific nodes, open up that graph script I had you make earlier. I bet you thought I'd forgotten. You underestimate me and are now my enemy for life. We're not going to do anything hugely crazy in here. This is only a beginner level thing, and to be honest, editor scripts confuse and terrify me. We are going to add a public base node current. This is a variable and is very similar to a function declaration. Public is the protection level, meaning we can use this variable in another script. Base node is the type, the thing we just made, and current is its name. The difference is that on its own, this doesn't do anything because it doesn't have any functionality. Instead, we can act on data to do things elsewhere, and we will in a minute. So now that we have that done, we can start making our nodes. Go ahead and make a new xnode node script, wherever you've put your xnode scripts. I'll wait. Name that node script something like dialogue node or words node or I don't know, I'm not like the CEO of Unity, just call it whatever you want. Open it up and in here we're going to add a decent amount of stuff, so feel free to pause and roll back if you get stuck. The first two entries in the script are input public int entry and output public int exit. These are important because they add the little entry and exit points on the nodes that we're going to need to make the whole enterprise work. Next, we add some of the data we'll need for a dialogue 
dialogue entry. In role-playing games and visual novels, there's usually a line telling us the name of the speaker, a line telling us what they're saying, maybe a sprite or something to tell us what they look like. So next, we had a public string speaker name for the name of the speaker, a public string dialogue line for the thing they say, and a public sprite sprite for the image of the character. We're almost done here, but we still have a little bit more to do to complete the picture. We need a way to access this data, because when we run the system, we won't know what node is coming next. We created the base node archetype for this reason so that we can call its functions and still get the specific data we're after. This means that to take advantage of the get string function that lets us get all of the data we've just made, we'll need to inherit from base node by changing the word node on this side of the colon to base node, and then overriding the get string function in base node down here. Overriding is useful because it allows you to create a broad type of object that you can refer to, but then get specific data from different sub-objects, so to speak. It stops you writing really long master scripts to couples complicated objects from each other and I don't know, some third thing, just do what I say. So the very basic implementation of my xnode system has us return all of the data in the form of a string that we can split later and test to figure out what kind of function we should run. If you want to go with that and your get string function, write return open speech marks in the name of the node. So dialogue node slash plus speaker name plus slash plus dialogue line plus slash plus hmm. We can't convert a sprite into words. I mean, okay, we can, but we'd have to make a whole library of sprites that we can reference, and honestly, who has the time? This is going to be longer than 10 minutes, as is, probably. Instead, if we want to be able to just pull a sprite from here, we can create a function that lets us get sprites from base nodes. It's exactly the same way we did it before for getting strings. In our base node class, add a public virtual sprite function called get sprite returning null. Then, back in our dialog node script, override this function and return our sprite from this node. Great, we're almost there, but we need to implement the system that reads these nodes and returns a response based on what it finds. To do that, create a new C sharp script, not a node or a graph or anything this time, and call it node parser or node reader or whatever you want to call it. Inside, give it a reference to a public object of the graph type you created earlier. This will allow us to add a graph to this object and run what it finds. Next, we need a process for running through all of the nodes inside. This bit is very code heavy, so just follow along as best you can. In our start function, we need to find the first node in our list. To do that, we have a couple of options, but the one I like the most and which I find the easiest is to just make a new node that inherits from base node and have to return start when it's get string function function is called. While you weren't paying attention, I did that. Here's the source code. This means we can run a for each loop on all of the nodes in the graph and get the one that returns start as our starting point. To implement this, type for each open brackets base node b in graph.nodes. b in the for each loop is our reference to whatever node it's found next, and this system will run through all of them until we tell it to stop. So let's tell it to stop when we find the right one. Although b is an enumerator variable, it still counts as a base node, meaning we can still run all of the base node functions on it. What this means is we can add an if statement. If b.getString equals equals start, that fires if it finds the starting point, and then make that node our entry to the graph. Inside that if statement, add a statement that reads graph.current equals b, followed by the word break. Break will end the for each loop early so that we don't go over a bunch of nodes we don't need to search. Cool, so now our graph is tracking the first node in the sequence. All we need now is a loop that goes through them all and processes them, and we're well on our way to having a functioning dialogue system. Under the graph variable you put at the top, create a new coroutine and name it underscore parser. Next, in the start function you created, type underscore parser equals start coroutine parse node. This will throw an error because we haven't made that function yet. So let's make it. Outside the start function, we're going to create a new kind of function called an i enumerator. This is different from a normal function for a few reasons, but it's important because it allows us to run code lines like yield return new wait for seconds and yield return new wait until. This will be important in a minute, so I'll explain why when we get there. Name this i enumerator parse node and open the squirrely brackets to give it some functionality. Inside, create a new base node b and make it equal to graph.current. This lets us reference the current node in the processing sequence. Next, to find out what type of node it is, we're going to create a string called data and make it equal to b get string. This will return the string we made earlier, the one full of like slashes or whatever. The slashes are important and you're about to see why. We're going to create a new variable with data type string open square brackets close square brackets. This isn't a string, but an array of strings, and an array is essentially just a list of a fixed length that contains a certain object. This lets us split up the string that we just got into its composite parts by assigning this new array to data.split. This will create a new list and populate it with the string split up by slash. This means all of the individual parts are now their own strings inside this data collection and we can act based on what's inside. Now you have a couple of options. I use if else statements because I'm the worst game developer yet created, but a switch statement would also work here. Either way, whatever implementation you choose, run an if or switch check on the first entry in your array by calling something like if data part zero equals equals dialog node. What we're doing here is we're checking the first entry in the array, index zero, and testing whether it equals dialog node, which hopefully it will if we did this right. Then we can add some more functionality. 
We want to display the text as well as the speaker of the text. So go ahead and create three new variables at the top of the script. We're going to make two of these text objects and the third an image object. And if you get an error here, it's because you need to go all the way to the top and write using unityengine.ui so that the script knows to use Unity's UI library. Next is the very simple case of assigning the dialogue and speaker strings to these text objects. Back in our I enumerator under the if statement we just made, reference these two objects by name, add .text afterwards, and make them equal data parts 1 and data parts 2. Hey, Harry in the editing booth here, so it turns out I completely forgot to include an assignment to the sprite in the script here because, like, apparently my brain just does not work correctly. Um, but to do it, it's very easy. Like like before, we're going to use an override function, so assign the sprite value of the image we created to b.getSprite, and that will put whatever sprite we have in that node on the image. I'd say I didn't make another mistake like this in the script, but I would be lying. The joys of tutorializing. Anyway, if you recall, these were the entries for the speaker name and dialogue line from our dialogue node earlier. Great. Now whenever it gets here, it'll make the line say whatever we tell them to. The problem is that it'll do that and then just like stop, because we haven't told it to do the rest of the nodes yet. So let's do that. Outside the iEnumerator, add a function called public void next node, and this time we're going to have the function accept some data. This function is going to take a string called field name. Inside the next node function, first check whether our iEnumerator is still running. We're going to want to stop it if it is, because otherwise it'll keep going and going and the results will be a bit screwy. We can start us up later when we're good and ready. First, check if underscore parser is null and if it is, run stop coroutine underscore parser and then underscore parser equals null. This will kill the coroutine if it's still running. Next, under that if statement, run a for each loop, this time for each node port p and graph.current.port. If you're getting an error here, similar to before, make sure to add using xnode at the top so we can access the xnode framework. Node ports in xnode are the little red dots on either side of the node. You can have as many inputs and outputs as you want, but we generally want a specific port. This is what the field name string we passed this function earlier is for. We can run an if statement, if p.fieldName equals equals field name, to check whether this is the port we're looking for. And if it is, we can get the node that it connects to by assigning graph.current to equal p.connection.node. Make sure to put another break statement. Finally, outside of the for each loop, bring back your underscore parser variable by assigning it the value of start coroutine pass node. This means it'll now just keep running and running until you tell it to stop. All you have to do now is add that next node exit function to your dialog node bit, but Wait a moment, if we run this right now in the hypothetical world where we've actually filled the graph in with anything, it'll complete the dialogue and skip immediately to the next line. We don't want that. Ideally, we'd like to wait until the player has clicked or pressed a button or something. The way I fix this problem is a slightly hacky way and there's probably a more efficient one, but I add two yield return new wait until statements. The first stops code execution until the mouse button is pressed down, and the second waits until the mouse button is released so that on one complete click it will continue to do things. Again, there's probably a better way of doing this, but it's a bit beyond the scope of this video I'm lazy, so cry more. All of the functionality we need now is done here. Well, yes, but actually no, because turns out I forgot to process the start node. That doesn't take any doing at all, though. All you have to do is run if data part zero equals equals start, and then just run your next node function immediately. It, it was a really weird oversight to make in the script. Again, I my just my brain was out of the office until like Monday, I don't know. But we still have to actually add these things to the world so that they work. Return to the Unity window and right click where you want to create a new graph. You'll see at the top of the context menu that the name of the graph type you created will be there. Click to make a new one and then double click the resulting object to open the Xnode window which looks like a grey grid. If you right-click inside that grid, a new context menu will appear, showing you a list of nodes you have available, the nodes you've created over the course of this tutorial. Create that start node and a dialogue node, then drag the red dot from the exit point of your start node to the entry point of your dialogue node. Fill in the details and voila, nothing happens. Well, I guess that's all I've got time for, guys. Thanks so much for watching. No, the problem is we just haven't added the node parser to our scene. There are other ways of doing it. You could make it static, but I don't really like doing that because I'm not very good at it, so no. What we're going to do is create an empty game object and pass it our C-sharp node parsing script we just created. Then add all of the UI elements you need to the boxes on the inspector window. Drag the two text boxes onto the two entries for text elements, the image to the image, and attach the graph you created to the entry for a graph. Now, if you play it, you'll see that the image and the text is what you wanted to say. If you add more dialogue, lines you can make it say more things and it'll wait for you to click and that's pretty much it you can make nodes that contain whatever kind of data you like so you can extend this to do basically whatever move a camera flash some lights on and off control enemy ai like i don't know man who cared